Grand Marais, Minnesota is the destination for our next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah tours the town and takes part in the dragon boat races, while Roger paints an active beaver dam near the marina. When you travel along the northwestern shore of Lake Superior in northeastern Minnesota and you reach a point about 40 miles south of the Canadian border, you'll find a town with a population of around 1,400 called Grand Marais. This area is bursting with summer energy and we easily spent a week here painting, observing and enjoying the landscape that we had driven over 1,600 miles to experience. A walk around town reveals that Grand Marais is interested in artistic ventures as well as sports. I found a terrific bookstore and several art galleries, and a museum, the North House Folk School, and an artist's colony that was started over 65 years ago by an artist named Bernie Quick. There's also an annual outdoor music and arts festival with crafts and food, plus fun things for children. During the summer, lots of activities take place right by the shore and on the lake, as you can imagine. There's canoeing, kayaking, sailing, motorboats, and fishing, to name a few. A short drive from the downtown, there are parks with campsites available, plus miles and miles of natural areas, with hiking trails along cascading falls, with perfect opportunities for photography and plein air painting. Now back to the shore for today's big event. Towards the end of July, if you're in a small town that's situated on a lake, you might be lucky enough to see some dragon boat racing. And you'll notice that behind me, they're loading up the boat. It takes about 20 people to paddle it, and then you have a drummer, and then you have someone who steers. The race will begin shortly, and it looks like a lot of fun. They let volunteers do the paddling, so everybody gets a turn. The volunteer crew are given life jackets and a paddle the correct length for their reach, plus some last minute instructions. One minute. The starting blast sounds and the race begins. They maneuver around the harbor, matching their strokes to the drum beat. Friends and relatives cheer them on while they furiously fight to the finish. A victory bell sounds, there are a few seconds of elation, and then another group prepares to race. This was a good way to spend an afternoon, watching people of many ages getting a chance to participate in this team sport that had its origin in China many centuries ago. And who would guess that very close by, there's a peaceful beaver dam that Roger wants to capture on canvas. The dragon boat races are right down there a few hundred feet, but I'm out here at Artist Point. It's a quiet spot and there's a beaver dam right here and that's what I'm going to paint today. I'm using a masonite board covered with gesso and I'm using acrylics. I have titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Indian yellow, cadmium yellow light. For the reds I have alizarin crimson and I have three earth colors, burnt sienna, burnt umber and yellow ochre. And I'm going to put one more color on my palette, and that is chromium oxide green. So I'm using a lot of colors today. Often I use a much more limited palette, but I vary that. So today I think I'm going to use a full palette of colors. Generally, I start with my darks first, but today I'm going to do something a bit different, and I'm going to paint the sky first. We have a very blue sky today, so I'm taking my ultramarine blue and white, but I don't like to use just those two colors because by putting ultramarine blue and white on a painting, everyone can tell that that's a tube color. So I'm going to take and warm that up some with some yellow ochre, and it will tone down that sky and not give it that harsh, look of blue. And I'm careful to use quite a bit of paint when I'm doing areas 
that are light in color. So I'm going to lay this on quite thick. And since these are acrylics, they will dry fast. And in no time, I'll be able to put my trees up over those. I've also got my little spray bottle here, my atomizer, and I can help to keep my paints wet and the paints on my palette wet. Now when I'm painting a large area like this sky, I try not to use a lot of small brush strokes that just sort of wastes time. I lay, I grab enough paint on here, I lay it on thick, just like I was painting a wall in a house. Or, and, and I can get that done in just a moment or two. I'm going to add some more cerulean blue up here towards the top to vary the color somewhat between the top and the bottom. Maybe a touch of ultramarine blue in there. And that way I'll have a bit of graduated color. Now it's quite damp out here today, so this may not dry as quickly as I think it will, but we'll see. Sometimes artists will take canvases and paint skies in the studio, flat skies like this, especially if you're using oils. And then when they come out on location, they'll already have sort of a base coat of a sky laid in already. And that's a good idea. Now, right now, I'm trying to decide where I want my horizon line. Do I want it up here high or down low? I definitely don't want it here in the middle to split my canvas, my board right in half. So I have to ask myself, what is this painting about? Is it about the tree and the sky, or do I want to pay more attention to what's below the tree, the water and all that texture? And I think I would like to concentrate more on the water and the texture. It just seems to be more interesting than the tree and the sky. The tree will make a nice division of my painting into thirds because the tree will be about here. And then we'll put the horizon up about this area. With my burnt sienna and my chromium oxide green, I'm going to put in this reflection down here. Now I could paint the water first, which is the same color as the sky approximately, but I think I'll do this in reverse and put in the reflections and then paint the water over that. Now you see what happens? when I mix a dark color with a light color. This happens to so many painters and I have to be careful of it myself. When you mix what's a rich dark color and it mixes in with a lighter color, it gets chalky and it makes a very weak painting. So I want to avoid that. So I may have to let this dry for a few more moments before I go up in here because this is sort of a nice rich color down here. And then when it mixes with this, it just gets to be just sort of a dull, drab, milky color. Not very pleasing. But I can continue down in this area and it won't be mixing with the sky, which is still a bit wet. I'm going to put some of this on as a thin wash right here. We do have a lot of rocks and things under the water. This is Lake Superior, so it's fresh water. I can see down in there nicely. I think this is dry now, so I'll take my dark colors, maybe ultramarine blue, burnt umber, just to make a very dark color. I'll add some Indian yellow and make a very dark kind of a brown in here. And this will be my base coat for all this foliage in here. Now, if this were still wet, I would get all those milky, chalky colors. But since it's dry, I still can maintain these dark colors. At this point, my main concern is to get the the right values in on a painting. In other words, my lights, my middle tones, and my darks. I want to be sure to keep this horizon line up about this area. This is one of the real advantages to using acrylics, so that they dry fast. And if you don't like something on the canvas or, or board, you can change it in a matter of just a moment or two. Well, we have that beautiful evergreen tree. Once again, I'm going to mix up some dark colors with my ultramarine blue and Indian yellow to make a dark green and a touch of alizarin crimson. And I'll get a very dark green. And I want to divide this board into thirds. So I'm going to put that tree right about here. It's not always necessary to divide a board into thirds, but if it's possible and you can do that, it's a nice way to 
get a good composition, sort of a fail-safe compositional start to any painting. We've got two trees over there. So I'm going to kind of go carefully here, but quickly. And I want to leave enough negative areas in here. And I can add some negative areas in later as well, by like mixing up the sky color again. And when I say negative areas, I just mean the space between the branches where the sky sort of pops through. I'm just picking up lots of different colors because I want to vary these greens. Don't want them all the same value or the same color green. But I am putting in my dark colors first. And then when those dry for a few moments, then I'll add the green, the lighter green highlights over them. I'm using a very light touch to my brush on the edge of these leaves. So just kind of flipping them out, create a nice soft feeling to the edge. And right down here is where the beaver dam is. So I'm going to take some of my burnt sienna, touch a yellow ochre. I'm not going to put any details in there yet with the twigs and the branches. I'm just going to block that in as one big shape. Okay, this, wow, this dries fast. This is dry. Now I can start building up another layer of this by adding some lighter green. I'm going to add a touch of white to that and maybe some cerulean blue to give it a little bit of depth, a little bit of atmosphere. Even though it's not that far away, in order to give this some depth, I want to push these colors to the cooler range in the back. So there'll be less contrast for anything back there, more contrast in the foreground. Here again, I'll use a light touch to keep this edge soft right here. Just a very light touch, sort of flip that up. I'm dragging a dry brush over the sky to get that edge nice and soft. I like those secondary set of trees back there, but having placed this set of trees here, if I place more trees over here, it's gonna sort of be unbalanced, too heavy on this side. So I think the solution would be to move this set of trees over to the left just a bit. And that way it'll give me some room to put in more of these secondary set of trees in here and not throw the balance of the painting off. So I'll just put a few more boughs of uh, foliage here from this evergreen tree. Move it, move it to the left here. Actually, it's good because it fills out this area. This area doesn't really say very much, so why just have it totally blank? We'll move this tree over. I'll also move the trunks over as I go. Now I'll put a, I'll place in a few of these evergreen trees in the background. Whole stand of them there. Now I need to push this big tree over more. Now in trying to repair an area like this, it's almost impossible to repair it without repainting this entire portion of the sky again, maybe the whole sky. But I think I can get away with just repainting this part of the sky on this side and leave this the way it is. Because inevitably, these colors will probably dry a little bit differently than you expect. And if I don't paint the rest of this, uh, you'll see where I applied the second coat. So I'll have two different colors of sky on there, which I don't want. And it really just doesn't take much time at all. It doesn't take any time at all just to repaint this part of the sky. Because all this painting is always about adjusting the colors and adjusting the composition. Well, I've got this dark brown color, which is sort of what's underneath the, the water here, the rocks and so on. So I'm going to put the water on top of this. And of course, this is dry now. So with this same color of sky, or approximately the same color of sky, I'm going to mix that up. I think it is a bit grayer than the sky, possibly. And I think what makes it a bit darker is we've got a lot of ripples on the water. They're reflecting off different things. Okay, right here we've got the reflection of the tree. So I want to go in from here and start to bring in this water this way. And again, I don't want to use a whole lot of small strokes. I want to lay this, block this in rather quickly, and reserve any details for later on. Now what's going to happen here is 
I'm going to let a lot of this dark color bleed through and show through, and especially down here where I can see the rocks under the water. You can see they're having the dragon boat races over there now. You can hear these strokes start to spread out some more because as I look down closer to the water, I see less of the reflection of the sky and more of the rocks. So down here, I won't put so much of the sky color. For my brushes, I'm using flats, and these are nice, fairly new brushes, so they have a nice chisel edge on it. it means it's a nice sharp edge across the top. It's not frayed out at all, so I can make a, a sharp line here with the edge of the brush. There is a time and a place for beat up old brushes, especially like in foliage and all, but I always try and have nice new brushes with me or brushes that are in good shape because it's hard to do a good painting with uh, bad brushes. Painting is hard enough without having materials that are gonna work against you. Wow, this is really fun out here. You know, one reason I wanted to do this painting is because I paint for myself primarily. This is not a commission or anything. And uh, the idea of painting a beaver dam is sort of special. So that's what kind of gives artists, any artist, uh, some inspiration, some excitement about painting. And then working on location like this is also nice because you get a feeling of what the area is, you kind of feel the weather, you feel all this. I think it really does translate itself in some way to the painting. Just hitting the edge of this with the chisel edge of my brush. Think some more highlights in here. Okay, enough of that because I don't want to go into too much refinement here until I move to the other area and refine it equally. So I'll go up in this area, work on the foliage again. I'm going to take my cadmium yellow and chromium oxide green. That will give me a much more vivid green than the Indian yellow. And I'm going to use the edge of my brush, scumble those colors on there. I think maybe a touch of burnt sienna. Don't want to get it too green or else it will look kind of false. Down here near the water line, it tends to be maybe not quite as alive or something. It's a little grayer, a little, a little, a little more red, red color. I'll add some of that burnt sienna in there, which makes kind of a nice warm variation here. Now, I haven't touched the uh, beaver dam at all yet, but I'm going to leave that for just a little while longer because it's basically all very dark and I'll take my small brush and I'll put some of those branches and limbs on there. Picking up a small pointed brush to put in the trunks of the tree. Now it's real natural to pick up burnt umber, some kind of a brown color when painting the trunk of a tree. But look at these things carefully and try and determine what color it actually is. Don't just assume that trunks of trees are, are all brown. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of green in there. It's kind of a warm color. It's very gray, but it's definitely not burnt umber out of the tube. I'll lay that trunk right in here. You see, I'm moving those trunks over this way, and those sit kind of behind the beaver dam. And with a touch more white, I'll add a highlight or two right on the side of these trunks, just where some sunlight is catching it. And really, I'm not seeing that much of a highlight on the side of the, the trunk, but I'm adding it because what I'm trying to do here is trying to depict it as a painting. I'm not trying to do a photographic study of this. I want this to look good as a painting, regardless of how it really looks here in real life. So I have to take my any painting skills I have and use them sort of against what I see. Sometimes I paint what I see and sometimes I paint what I would like to see. So I have some artistic freedom here to really do what I want. My sky color again, my ultramarine blue, touch of yellow ochre. And I'm going to put in a few more negative areas here I kind of lost all those negative areas when I moved this tree over. So I'm going to reposition some negative areas. As I paint these negative areas, you can see I'm painting them between these large trunks. And that will help to describe the trunk of the tree by placing the negative areas on each side 
of the trunk. Again, with a small brush, I'll take a dark color. Could be any color, really, you know. I'm just gonna build, take uh, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. Give me kind of a neutral dark color. And I'll add some of the some of the foliage up here, just with a very light touch of my brush. Put in these twigs and branches, They're sort of going every which way. I have to have a very light touch when I do this. I don't want these to look heavy and bulky. Not sure I even needed them, but there they are. You know, I think I'll put a few more of those trees in the background too, these trees like here. I'll just have a few more of these evergreens coming up here in the distance. And now I'm going to wipe my brush off and put some of the foliage right in here. I don't want to apply very much paint to that because I want it to have that sort of lacy look where you can see through that. You know, here's another case. I put something on there. I thought it would look good. I'm not too happy with those branches going up there, even though I see them in the landscape here. I'm going to mix some of my sky color again, and I'm just going to paint that out. I'm never afraid to take something out or change it, even halfway through the painting. So I'll just take out those bushes, and I think I'll take this tree out too. It's too much of a balance between these two here. So I'll just take that out too. And I'll put one more evergreen instead of here, place it closer to this. Okay, time to work on the beaver dam. Yellow ochre, alizarin and crimson, maybe a touch of blue. I'll start with a darker value first. I think I'll spray my board and that way this wet paint will flow over the dry paint and just place some of these twigs and branches in here. I'm starting out with these darker values and then in a moment I'll pick up some paint of a lighter value place over the darker values. So I'm working from dark to light here. We have a few larger tree trunks coming down here. Now for the lighter color and this gives me a chance to add a few reflections. I'm going to use my fan brush and right here on the edge of the bank, just going to flip up a few strokes of that warm color. Maybe back here too. And I can actually use this fan brush to create a few more of the twigs that make up the beaver dam. Right down here in the shore in the foreground, I can see some of the rocks under the water. I'm going to spray my board and I'm going to mix up a dark color and I'm going to try and indicate a few of the rocks and pebbles I see underneath. The water is moving quite a bit, so they're quite distorted. So I'm just going to indicate a few of those here and there. I'm going to place those on kind of as a wash, just a thin wash. And a couple highlights to go along with that. Since this beaver dam is kind of the center of interest in the painting, I'll make a few of these branches brighter. And then I can add that reflection right down below it. Well, this has been fun painting this beaver dam. I'm going to take a few reference photographs and I think I may add a few more touches to this back in the studio. This was a great place to paint, and before I began painting the beaver dam, I did another painting about a hundred yards away where this painting was done at what was appropriately named Artist Point. Sarah and I spent quite a bit of time there. It was here that I met fellow artist Neil Sherman, and we not only painted the seashore, but late one afternoon we painted a model as she posed on the rocks. Finishing a painting is basically about refinements. This painting didn't have a very strong composition, so I knew I needed to accentuate areas where the center of interest was. So the first thing to do was to bring more detail and especially contrast to the tree branches and limbs of the beaver dam. Anything with a strong contrast will become a focal point. So more branches were added with lighter and darker values. I also added some darker areas in that same area between the branches to further heighten that contrast. Reflections were added in the water with a light touch. 
A large post and several small ones gave even more emphasis around that center of interest. Color and more contrast was placed in among the foreground shrubbery and a thin line representing the shoreline defined the greenery from the water. More contrast was added to the trees since they make up another very large area that needed more definition. Both lighter greens and darker tones gave the tree a bit more form. I noticed the sky wasn't covered as well as it should be, so I repainted it, and doing this was not very difficult. It only took a minute, but it made a big difference. And while it was still wet, I mixed the sky color with some white and yellow ochre and lightened the area down towards the horizon. A few negative areas were placed in among the trees in the background, and I continued to add more contrast to the foliage along with a hint of small branches. The water needed more work, so I began by misting the board with a spray bottle. By doing this, the paint would be less likely to give me a hard edge as the moisture would allow for the paint to naturally flow out into those sprayed areas and give me that soft edge I was looking for. I was careful not to cover too much of the water with these lighter tones of blue as I wanted the warm brown areas which indicated the rocks and sand under the water to continue to show through. Towards the end of the painting on location, a beaver swam by, so here in the studio I thought it would be nice to add it as a finishing touch, just as a small accent, and one which wouldn't really be noticed at first glance. So there it is, the beaver dam. For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.